Agent Johnson's journal. Infiltration of the Youth Anarchist League, a success. The disguise worked perfectly, and I was able to sit in on their secret public meetings. These subversives have many plans to tear down the state. They intend to knowingly and willingly feed the homeless and are planning something they call a book fair. Not sure what that is. I must investigate further. The recommendation is simple. Try and drive a divide. If they go through with feeding the homeless, maybe assassinate their leader. So if you're a left-wing activist or part of any sort of organization that does something radical like want to keep the planet alive, you've probably been a victim of COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO is an FBI organization that has, uh, to different levels of success, managed to keep the left suppressed within American politics. To do so, they've done everything from sowing division, death threats, possibly even murders. And while I made a video in the past about why there's no left-wing party in American politics, I didn't quite get enough into the role the FBI played in actively making sure it never happened. And of course, this story, like all stories, begins somewhere. So today we're gonna talk about the birth of the FBI and counterintelligence, and essentially how this anti-democratic machine came into being. Hello, my name is six-time BAFTA winner Bernard Cronshaw. You might know me as the star of the hit YouTube series Step Back History. You might also know me as the butler from the body political thriller 420 Downing Street, or as the inventor of the Marmite Dorito. But today we are taking a brief interruption from our regular content to talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a learning community where millions come together to learn brand new skills ranging from illustration, design, photography, really anything that you want. And for less than $10 a month with an annual membership, you can get uh, access to tons of skills. There are many courses out there that are life-changing in the skills you can get, learning how to freelance, learning how to organize your life, all sorts of wonderful things. But today, I'm just gonna take a nice, Nice relaxing break to learn how to paint teacups with a wonderful teacher in Alana Cartier. So, I have a wonderful deal for you. The first thousand people who sign up will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium service. Isn't that wonderful? You get to tonight set yourself up, tuck on in, and enjoy. Now, let's get back to the content. Oh, and I hope the British people are watching, um, trans rights. Hello, my name is Tristan Johnson, this is Step Back. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification to never miss another history video. So how did the freest nation of freedom in the free world <laughs> develop what is essentially America's secret police in the form of COINTELPRO? It's actually quite the story that has a lot to do with hating immigrants, suppressing left-wing politics, hating immigrants, the Red Scare, and hating immigrants. Like many police institutions, you'd actually be surprised how recently the US basically had no federal level police. What would become the feds was the US Department of Justice. The DOJ covered a mix of disorganized law enforcement agencies like the Secret Service. They essentially outsourced their work to marshals and private detectives. In 1892, even these outsourcing options were removed and the DOJ became notorious for being essentially unable to get much of anything done. You'd be surprised how recently law enforcement extended barely beyond grabbing the closest person of color they could find, say they did the crime, and extrajudicially murder them. Yeah, it's almost as if the entire institution has always been steeped in racism and should be abolished, still. Anyway, I'm getting distracted and my mom got mad at me the last time I railed on the fuzz on my channel, so let's just mosey along. Around the 20th century, a particular whoopsie doodle involving President McKinley, led people to think that maybe the police should be professionalized in some capacity. And a mere eight years later, Attorney General Charles Bonaparte decided to ask Congress for resources to start a small elite force to run investigations for the Justice Department. However, Congress decided to instead say 12 and restrict their investigative capacity even more by saying they couldn't just outsource it to the Secret Service. Those boys were to be kept busy making sure an anarchist didn't reshoot the president. Bonaparte decided to go around Congress and put together a crack team made up of former Secret Service officers to make 
special agents in charge of investigations on behalf of the DOJ. These agents were the seed of what would become the treasured FBI. To make sure Congress didn't see this as an overreach of the federal government's power, wow, those are the days, these 30-some agents mostly worked on issues dealing with interstate commerce and antitrust laws. President Howard Taft's Attorney General George Wickersham secured funding for this group and officially established the Bureau of Investigation in 1909. This new bureau was founded on a gentleman's agreement. It was a powerful norm that their work would stay limited to things like fraud and damage to public property, but it very soon expanded to things like interstate human trafficking and the like. You know, the things a normal federal investigation force might do and nothing secret police at all. But then everything changed when the Austrians attacked Serbia. And then a few years later, the U.S. joined in the worldwide conflagration of what could only be called the worst family therapy session in human history, the First World War. And Americans were shocked to find Germans had been infiltrating America since the 1670s. This goes deeper than we thought. It wasn't just Germans that were the threat. The Bureau worked with vigilante mobs, I mean, volunteer organizations of loyal citizens called the American Protective League. Oh boy. And enlisted their help to track down anyone who wasn't registering for the draft. These eager volunteers with police help raided and arrested hundreds of thousands of people suspected of draft dodging, of which less than 1% were actually doing said crime. Because, you know, they went after people who were old or children or people with disabilities for the crime of not having a draft card they were ineligible for. Or, you know, they just committed the treasonous crime of having left their draft card at home. Mob justice. It's a hell of a thing. So despite this being a violation of people's civil liberties, and I'm pretty sure constitutional violations as well, this was seen as a massive success. Agents continued these raids to the point where it became their go-to move when trying to arrest lots of people. But then, then the largest threat to American national security occurred. What was it? The World War? German U-boats? Segregation in the South? Oh no, much, much worse. In the very American state of the Russian Empire, a group of plucky rogues called the Bolsheviks launched a revolution to depose and kill the imperial family and a few thousand anarchists just for fun. And with their evil promises of bread, peace, and land, Americans began to freak out about the Reds. And when there's a moral panic to oppress a group of egalitarians made up primarily of ethnic minorities, the feds will be there. A law passed in 1918 called the Alien Act had language expressly to exclude and expel what they called, quote, anarchistic classes. This meant anyone who wanted to overthrow the government, which quickly turned into anyone who spoke out against the government or the war effort. I guess Kronstadt was still three years away, so the irony of lumping communists into this law would only come in retrospect. Now, apparently in 1919, a bunch of bombs went off around the country. The police then found that whoever set off these bombs conveniently left anarchist leaflets around the place, including the home of then Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. He then revitalized the B.I., giving it its own intelligence division headed by Assistant Attorney General Francis Garvin and helped by a younger lawyer named John Edgar Hoover. The idea of the GID was to engage in counterintelligence against subversives. Counterintelligence is when you try not only to gather intelligence on an organization, but do covert actions to try and break it apart. Dig up dirt on them, sow division, that sort of thing. Before long, it became a colossal intelligence gathering organization and was ready for a massive raid on anyone to left wing. And raid they did. In late 1919 and early 1920, the Palmer Raids, as they were called, arrested as many as 10,000 immigrants for the crime of being communists or anarchists. Step back viewers might remember this, for being the sweep that arrested and eventually deported my personal hero, Emma Goldman. Yeah, not even kidding. If you look right there, a wonderful viewer actually sent me a print of Emma Goldman when she got 
arrested. Surprisingly, thousands of people's illegal mass arrests for the crime of expressing their free speech didn't make the Bureau popular. The Assistant Secretary of Labor criticized Palmer and Hoover for the raids, and in response, Hoover got agents to start digging up dirt on him. This more or less destroyed Palmer's political career, and the Bureau took quite a hit. The Harding administration shook up the Bureau, but still maintained the GID. There were strikers forming unions, and those unions had to be taken down after all. And then, of course, there was the more legitimate work of infiltrating and taking down the resurgent Ku Klux Klan. The Bureau, however, got in hot water again when Hoover ordered agents to try and dig up dirt on and try to compromise a senator who criticized improprieties within the DOJ. This soon became public and gave the Bureau yet another black eye. The then head of the Bureau, a man named William J. Burns, was fired over it and replaced with none other than J. Edgar Hoover, who would run what he rebranded as the Federal Bureau of Investigation from 1924 until he died in 1972. Now, who the hell is J. Edgar Hoover? A creature of Washington, D.C. from birth, Hoover began his career in the DOJ at 22. His first assignment, with President Woodrow Wilson's approval, was to use the 1917 Espionage Act to arrest any immigrants suspected of being disloyal to the state. They'd be thrown in jail without trial. Then, at 24, he became head of the GID. The first Red Scare allowed him to launch all sorts of illegal operations to disrupt the work of whoever the state decided were dangerous radicals, including the infamous Palmer Raids. In 1924, he rose in rank to head of the whole damn department, and he wasn't even 30. Throughout his entire career, a disregard for civil liberties and an obsessive hatred of communists would color the whole FBI, which grew into an extension of Hoover himself in his near five decades of leadership. Memoirs of FBI agents speak of Hoover as a visionary leader. The whole department grew around his every desire. Hoover's FBI remained an obscure organization for several years as he transformed it from the ground up. Hoover emphasized professionalization, and primarily the organization functioned to collect statistics tracking crime waves in the new Prohibition era. In the 1930s, the FBI gained a world-class crime lab, a fingerprint identification system, and sold itself as the best of the best in law enforcement. Agents went by the name of G-Men, which stands for government men, and their reputation grew as they took down notorious gangsters like John Dillinger, Machine Gun Kelly, and Bonnie and Clyde. Dillinger's case was so dramatic and widespread, it was dramatized in the 1935 movie G-Men. Overnight, these G-Men made FBI and gangster movies a staple genre of film, and the FBI became superheroes. Hoover saw this as an opportunity and soon established a whole FBI media strategy. Endorsing comics, films, and radio shows, he'd make sure those who portrayed the FBI positively received close collaboration with the Bureau. Fan clubs grew up around these G-men, and Hoover became a national celebrity. And a new president administration was about to come in and change the federal landscape forever. The days of cautiousness about expanding federal power dropped with the mounting economic crisis of the Great Depression, which pushed Franklin Delano Roosevelt into the White House. Roosevelt promised a vast expansion of federal programs to fight the Depression. With the growth of the federal government came a change in the FBI. After a lull in intelligence work, the FBI was called back into action against critics of the New Deal, as well as populists like Huey Long. Anyone who challenged Roosevelt's authority became targets of FBI intelligence gathering. In the case of Huey Long, a lot of those counterintelligence activities came into use, which would build the handbook of COINTELPRO campaigns. And to top it all off, domestic intelligence gathering consolidated under the FBI right before the Second World War. And of course, this entire apparatus also extended towards communists. FDR saw covert dirt digging as a better way to suppress them than witch hunts like the Dyes Committee, which became the basis for the House on American Activities Committee. This included wiretapping, bugging meeting sites, making anonymous calls and sending letters, planting false evidence, and burglaries to gather evidence. You know, the usual legal stuff that happens in a democracy. As Hoover's anti-communist paranoia grew, he then would run afoul of the now Truman White House by sharing his intelligence with HUAC. So he was now feeding the witch hunt anyway. 
That was all going to change, though, with the I'm just kidding. The Eisenhower White House loved the FBI and wanted to bring them back into the fold. Former FBI agents got critical positions in the State Department. Hoover returned the favor by turning on McCarthy and Hueck, both of which were frustrating old Ike. All right, but the good times of openly suppressing left-wing organizations had to come to an end sometime. Nah, it's still going on today, sorry. Yet it did hit a skid when a 1955 Supreme Court decision came to the conclusion that the FBI could not just prosecute people for believing things. They now needed at least something resembling a reason to spy on people. So the FBI formalized their intelligence and counterintelligence projects into a program called, and I can finally say it now, COINTELPRO-CPUSA. It was nothing new, but it formalized and centralized what they had been doing anyway, so it was all now quote unquote legal. They determined that Communist Party USA threatened a violent takeover of the United States, despite 1956 being a year of significant decline for the party. In 1956, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev admitted to Stalin's crimes, which really depressed support for communist projects. The party really wasn't a threat anymore. However, this was not about real threats to the state. COINTELPRO was about the systematic dismantling of any and all left-wing politics in America, a story we'd see over the next few decades of these programs. COINTELPRO CPUSA got no political opposition. Hoover saw this as a green light to expand the attack to the civil rights movement, the Puerto Rican independence movement, and later anti-Vietnam war protesters. The template had been well drawn to institute the FBI as America's KGB, Stasi, or Gestapo. Essentially, it's secret police. Membership in CPUSA dropped that year, and the FBI saw this as a big success for the program. Of course, not enough to end it, but enough to consider it a W. They then expanded it to the Socialist Workers Party, a rival socialist party made up of Trotskyites who left CPUSA in the late 1920s. President Kennedy didn't oppose it, so they continued to expand. As they attacked the civil rights movement in the 1960s, they spied on nearly every civil rights movement in the South, as well as the NAACP. They spent extra resources to destroy and discredit civil rights icon Martin Luther King, whether they had a hand in his murder is still up for debate, but it's not entirely out of the question for this program. I made a video about MLK's assassination, though, that you can watch here. The militant black rights group, the Black Panthers, were heavily spied upon and harassed by COINTELPRO, including, again, murder. To be fair, this effort also expanded to the white supremacist group, the Ku Klux Klan. They only did so because they got political pressure after the KKK murdered a whole bunch of civil rights workers, but they did eventually do something. Leaked intel shows, though, that their anti-left versus anti-right COINTELPRO efforts skewed left 99 times to one. Spying on the KKK did let the FBI expand the definition of subversives worthy of counterintelligence. It grew the boundaries of what the FBI felt they had the right to attack. This led to their COINTEL program against what they dubbed the New Left a vague term for an invented group of various civil and political rights protesters. This included anti-war groups and student groups. You know, basically young people who disapproved of what the government was doing. It got so out of hand, Hoover actually started becoming the voice of caution against ballooning surveillance and counterintelligence apparatus. We know about these programs because of a 1971 break-in of an FBI resident agency in Media, Pennsylvania. A group called the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI played the Bureau's own tricks back at them and made off with a treasure trove of documents exposing these programs. The leaks were a massive blow to the FBI and led to an official dismantling of their programs. They apologized in 1974, but beyond that, little seems to have changed at the FBI. Reports of COINTELPRO tactics seem to paint a picture of their efforts not really stopping. Furthermore, the war on terror gave them even more leniency to spy on dangerous camping trips and the like. States will always need programs like COINTELPRO to function because the nature of states, the fact that they are non-voluntary organizations that impose a hierarchy on you, means that the general populace needs to be essentially suppressed at any given time in order to maintain their power. Otherwise, you know, they might win and people would not be dominated over, which is completely antagonistic to the idea of states as concepts. Anyways, here's a thing to click, possibly part two of this series. This video does well, and I'll see you guys next time.